Thank you all for joining us and welcome to ADA with FMZ, a global initiative to bring in leaders' perspective as well as education series. And today the whole uh, world is talking about uh, uh, carbon neutral and net zero. And let's uh, today discuss about what exactly the organizations are doing globally. And I would like to welcome Dean Stanbury, who is going to be part of the leadership series and uh, supported by my co-host, uh, Lisa. So thank you and over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much. We're really pleased to have Dean on the uh, video, on the series with us. Dean uh, is a leader in global sustainability and a leader in IFMA. So let's kick off by starting with an intro to you, Dean. And um, if you would, please tell us about your role with IFMA and particularly as a leader in global sustainability efforts. Certainly, thank you all for joining today. I'm uh, pleased to be here. Um, now, I've had two careers. I started out in uh, IT. Um, I actually ran uh, large scale data centers for a uh, telecom company and then took a right turn into real estate and facilities. And when I did that, I uh, found that I needed to learn a little bit more about uh, managing administrative space because I'd done critical infrastructure. And that's when I um, found IFMA and I joined IFMA and started getting some of the education there. Now, like most, I started out as a, as a chapter member. Um, then one day in a meeting, there was a, a request to the audience asking if anyone would like to participate in the committee. And I raised my hand and the rest was history. Um, from there, I've served in a number of uh, IFMA volunteer leadership positions, including the Denver chapter president, uh, the IFMA Foundation Board of Trustees, and the Global Board of Directors. Currently, I serve on the executive committee as the second vice chair of the global board, and I chair the uh, uh, government affairs committee. I developed a passion for uh, sustainability back in the early 2000s and was involved with the inaugural, uh, IFMA's inaugural sustainability committee. Uh, when IFMA created the communities of practice components around 2015, the sustainability committee transitioned to become the Environmental Stewardship, Utilities and Sustainability Community, or ESUS for short. I served as the chair of ESUS or ESUS uh, from 2017 to 2021, and I still serve on the ESUS board. In addition to my IFMA volunteer work, I also served as the USGBC uh, Mountain Region Board of Directors for a number of years, culminating in uh, being a chair of that board. Thank you. You certainly bring a lot to the table. Uh, as a part of your, your work, you had let me know that IFMA is coining, coining the term pathway to carbon neutrality to replace the term net zero. Would you talk to us a little bit about the reasons for that change and what IFMA hopes will come as a result? Certainly. Um, it's really more of a case of adopting the term than coining it because, uh, you know, it's, it's been around in, in various versions for a while. But let's start with what net zero actually means. Net zero refers to achieving a balance between the amount of greenhouse emissions produced and the amount removed from the atmosphere. There are two paths to achieving net zero that work in tandem. One is reducing existing emissions and the other is actively removing greenhouse gases. What we were finding is that the term net zero was a bit intimidating and conjured up visions of having to move from the current state to this net zero state uh, in one giant step. Well, in reality, you know, that uh, will be a transition that occurs in phases. Also, the technology for large scale carbon removal really does not exist yet, but progress is being made. In the meantime, there are an array of options that to reduce carbon emissions. So the term pathway to carbon neutrality is depicting a journey and not a destination. IFMA is providing a diverse range of information and education to its members on the science and technology of carbon, or more specifically, CO2. FMs will need to make decisions on when to change out existing systems uh, for lower carbon options. They will also need to evaluate commercial products uh, offerings to determine which ones live up to their carbon reduction claims and can meet their operational performance requirements. This entails everything from carpet to furniture, paint, concrete, mechanical systems, and vehicles. So this new knowledge and skill sets are required now and not off in some distant future. 
Thank you, Dean. I think uh, good insight. So I wanted to look at uh, from a different perspective when we talk about reducing the carbon emission. And uh, I still see that uh, there are a lot of organizations uh, import furniture, fixtures, and other materials, right? So typically, when we are all uh, committing towards uh, carbon neutral as well as net zero, where do you think that we should be looking in a different aspect with respect to procuring local materials which can be sourced, which can also reduce the travel emissions? How can an FM add value to this in a global perspective? Okay, um, well, FMs actually have more within their sphere of control than they might think. Um, consider a building operating schedule, you know, armed with basic building performance data and occupant or production patterns. An FM can fine tune the operational hours for heating or cooling, which reduces energy consumption, thereby reducing energy cost and reduces carbon emissions. And this is a relatively no cost option. Um, you can also work with suppliers to ensure you're getting the most environmentally friendly, you know, restroom or break room products, for example. Again, there may be little or no cost differential, but you're effectively reducing the carbon footprint and having an impact on the scopes two and three emission factors. When you look at things like water fixtures, um, you know, you have to determine if they are low flow. Uh, if you have low flow options installed and they do they have the automatic on off capability water is a still a relatively low cost utility at the moment but keep in mind that water must be treated and then pumped to its point of use and all of which require energy and therefore produces carbon emissions many people are surprised to learn that it takes approximately 25 gallons of water to produce one kilowatt of electricity so fresh water is a finite resource and it's becoming more scarce in the places that we need it the most. So there's very little about the operation of a facility that does not consume energy and produce CO2 that falls within the scopes one, two or three emissions as defined by the greenhouse gas protocols. Some actions we take may have small reductions in CO2 emissions, but it's the sum total of all of our actions that move the needle closer towards that net zero objective. That's, that's actually a perfect lead into my next question. You've talked about the fact that reducing carbon emissions isn't about one or two actions, it's about thousands. What would you advise for the average facility manager with limited resources to focus on for their efforts toward that goal? Uh, I think that was uh, what I was kind of talking about was looking at all of those little things. Um, and I think uh, Vinay was, was asking, um, you know, what are the things that are going on uh, around the world? And, you know, there, there's been an acceleration of, um, you know, not only new technologies, uh, we'll talk about regulation here in a minute, I believe, um, but we're moving away from what was, you know, voluntary and limited options to, um, you know, more uh, global, uh, certainly things being enacted by uh, governmental agencies and you know we're we're really looking for people to sort of pick up the pace. Um, when we look at you know the targets, trying to reach that um, you know 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, increase or the the limit the 1.5 um, by 2050, you know we're kind of behind the curve. We're not really uh, where we need to be. Um, and what that really says is that you know, 1.5 degrees Celsius is to avoid the most disastrous effects of climate change. So if we see a, a higher rise than that, you know, what we can expect is um, more risk from climate change, uh, whether it's, you know, rising sea levels, increasing uh, storms, uh, damaging storms, um, the heat factor, there's, there's already places on the earth, certainly in, uh, uh, in Africa that um, they're uninhabitable because the heat gets to be so hot, it, it cannot be tolerated by humans. Um, and even in the U.S., you know, about 80 percent of the population lives along the coastlines, uh, certainly within either reach of rising sea level or from hurricanes and other large storms. So, you know, looking at, you know, what those risks are, um, there, there's other risk too, as, as the heat rises, it affects agriculture, it affects the 
So you no longer out of crops as you it was slightly lower. Uh, so those are all problems that we have to solve in order to, you know, maintain our place on this planet if we want to say there. And as, you know, many say there is no planet B, you know, we only have the one and we're not going to be moving to another one um, in another galaxy far, far away anytime soon. You, you certainly make a, a compelling um, case for the need to take action, but even among those who believe that reducing emissions is important or even critical, there is some resistance to changing technologies. It might cost their company more, they may be having a hard time making the cost benefit statement, um, or that they may feel like the technologies aren't quite ready to support the needs. What advice can you give for an FM struggling with that challenge in their organization? You know, up to now, sustainability has been more of a nice to have um, rather than, and it's been an entirely optional business imperative. So some environmentally conscious companies have made a point of tracking their carbon reduction efforts, but they've realized few rewards for investors and consumers from that. But today we're seeing a rapid transition from voluntary uh, energy efficiency initiatives to legislation, regulation, and mandates. Um, those early adopter uh, environmentally conscious companies may already meet their energy efficiency mandate requirements, while others who have been claiming to have met the, their environmental uh, to be environmentally friendly uh, in their annual reports are now going to have to prove it. So that's going to be an interesting transition. Um, everybody has probably heard about ESG reporting or environmental, social, and governance, uh, which is essentially a, a uh, a follow on to corporate social responsibility or CSR. CSR was sort of the early attempt to uh, report on these activities, but it, again, it was voluntary and there were no standards around it. And whatever people put in their reports, um, the, as they say, there was a lot of greenwashing involved. <laughs> um, so, you know, ESG is getting a great deal of attention and it's going to impose a more formal and auditable reporting structure. But today, ESG reporting standards have not yet emerged. So it's, it's not quite there yet, but certainly it's moving in that direction. And as of a week ago, last Monday, the uh, U.S. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission released their guidance, uh, which is going to be um, ESG um, uh, declaration um, auditing, basically. it's You're going to have to be able to prove it. Um, now, this is mainly for the benefit of investors because investors are looking at these this reporting to decide, is this a company we want to invest money in? And so the SEC is trying to protect the investor uh, by putting some of these you know, reporting uh, declaration mandates in place. Now, FMs have not necessarily been in a position to dictate environmental strategy, but as legislation and regulation emerge, it will be handed down from the executive ranks as it's no longer an optional activity. So FMs really need to be prepared with a list of environmental projects uh, capturing the cost, the priority, the benefits, and the CO2 reduction values as regulations uh, by jurisdiction along with uh, um, or uh, excuse me, regulation will vary by jurisdiction along with their uh, related efficiency targets and timelines. So when faced with a daunting efficiency target, the savvy FM can be really a hero to the C-suite by providing an implementation ready plan that meets the mandated targets. You know, keep in mind that regulation will occur in phases as well. There will likely be short-term and long-term targets. So understanding the ultimate objective can inform your implementation plan and the timing of the capital spending. And an FM really needs to keep abreast of the progress on local legislation and regulation within their geographic span of control so they're prepared when laws and regulations go into effect. But they also be aware that regulation can uh, emerge from both local, state, and federal level so you need to be mindful of all those jurisdictions that might exercise control over your business. 
So certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has distracted us from, you know, world, other world changing events. But as the pandemic subsides, our attention is kind of turning back towards the climate crisis. We may not have recognized the early signs of human caused climate change, um, but it can no longer be ignored. And we do have the intelligence and the technology to avoid the most disastrous effects. Thank you, Dean. I think uh, you very well covered the challenges FM faces when it goes with the business case. I think it has to be from arsenal to legislative. It has to be top down approach because when you go with any sustainability initiatives and there is a cost associated, for example, it's a green cleaning initiatives, right? Alternate power sources are green credits. Uh, from uh, ESG has been talk of the town, basically, even in India, uh, we've been looking at how the organizations are committing towards uh, ESG reporting. Uh, what are the key two things you, uh, from the experience, you say, start starting point for an FM so that uh, you can start building a business? Because as you rightly said, uh, before it becomes mandatory, the FM has to be ready with the business case, with the initiative and the strategy to implement. Uh, what I see is also is a lack of awareness, typically, uh, when I talk to most of the FM. Again, the biggest challenge is how do they communicate with the stakeholders as well as uh, the end users. So what is that you think that how do we create more awareness from a global perspective, from an importance perspective, and a benefit that it contributes as, as a good corporate citizenship? Okay, let me see if I can unpack that. Um, so, you know, FMs, uh, one of the challenges with FMs when they, you know, talk about the need to upgrade uh, building systems is they often talk about the functionality of the system, but not the risk to the business. So, uh, and that's what really the executives uh, who are going to be approving this, uh, you know, respond to, you know, what is the risk if, if I don't have this system? Uh, could be your air handling system. Well, you know, what's the risk of your air handling system going down? Well, you can't occupy a building if there's no air moving in it. Um, so what does that mean in terms of both productivity and uh, revenue loss? You know, depending on what the business does, those are the real risks that you need to um, uh, describe to the executives so that they uh, get a sense of why we need to spend the money. Um, also, just doing a better job of, of planting the seeds. You need a longer term capital plan. It's never a surprise that your roof is way beyond its useful end of life and it's leaking and needs to be replaced. Um, you knew that three years ago, maybe five years ago, that should have been, you know, prepping the, uh, the finance group so that you say, you know, within three to five years, we have to make a capital investment in this roof and it's not going to be cheap. Uh, so that those things can be planned and and uh, put into into the, the budget plan, because it's never um, ideal to have to go get that funding, you know, within the fiscal year uh, to go to the, uh, the CFO and say, I need a half a million dollars of your precious capital that goes towards generating revenue to replace a roof. And what you get when you're done is a new roof that doesn't leak. But um, you know, it's not really generating revenue per se. Uh, so those are some of the things, you know, and when we talk about ESG reporting and, and other areas, you know, what can the FM do? You, you know, you mentioned, um, I think, smart buildings um, and automation. You know, uh, commercial real estate is really the last industry to go digital. And unfortunately, across the board and up and down the, the uh, chain, leadership chain, uh, very few people have uh, very good technology skills. They don't have the core skills. So when you start talking about data analytics, um, you know, most people's eyes glaze over and, you know, starts going over their head. Um, but when we get into ESG reporting, the E portion of it, environmental, is largely going to be part of the FM's domain. They're going to have to provide the data that goes into that ESG report. The first question that's going to come out of the auditor's mouth is, how do you know that it's accurate? So you can't just provide a number. You're going to have to be able to provide the evidence that it's accurate. So if you're providing some data that's based on a sensor, the question is, when was the last time that sensor was calibrated? How do you know that data is accurate? 
Um, it's complete and accurate and timely. That's when I talk about data. Those are the three characteristics that you want to look at um, most frequently, complete, accurate, and timely. And so if you can't prove that, and if you don't understand what that means, um, you could be providing information that is um, incorrect, and that could end up costing the company a lot of money or, or cause it issues if their ESG report is proven to be faulty. Thank you so very much. Vinay, any other follow-up questions? You're on mute, Vinay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and I think uh, Lisa has given much more uh, global perspective than what we could have anticipated. I think uh, you very well covered from a governance perspective and uh, how an FM should take initiatives, being prepared and also being watchful about how it, we can translate these actions or activities, how the data accuracy has to be there to prove to management. I think today is the era of uh, decision making through the data. It, data plays a critical role. Uh, it was wonderful. I think uh, we'd like to continue more on uh, leadership series with the ESG and other things in going forward. And I would like to thank you for taking out your time and being part of this. And thank you, Lisa, for leading it. And uh, thank you, everyone, for watching this space. And watch out for uh, future videos. Thank you all once again. Thank you both. Yes, thank you.